In this last part of the book of Isaiah, chapters 1 to 39, we are going to look at the issue of sin, God's emotions or reaction to it, and the solution to the problem. Judah's sin. As you can see, we have the description of the sinful attitude of the people. On the one hand, they have haughty eyes and lofty pride, means they elevate themselves about everybody else, but at the same time, they bow to idols, the works of their hands. Isaiah sees it as a contradiction. How can you think that you are better than everybody else and at the same time you worship wood, stone or that kind of objects of idolatry? Number two, on the one hand they consider themselves wise and shrewd, but they do not know they got. And as the Bible tells us, it is in knowing God that we truly become wise. Point three talks about the corruption of the leadership and the abuse of the ordinary people by the leaders of Judah. And finally, point four talks about the reversal of values. A fool is called a noble person and a wicked person is being honored. What happened to Jerusalem and the whole land because of the whole situation? Prophet speaks about lack of justice, the land and the city being filled with idolatry and greed. Then there is pride, which we already mentioned, but there is no worship of God or the worship of God is just plain lip service. Isaiah continue in this line talking about forgetting God, rejecting God's law and his word, and inability to see God's hands and deeds behind the events of history. Finally, what we already mentioned is the reversal of values. Good is called evil and evil is called good. No wonder that God has to do something about it. Let us read first Isaiah 30, 27 to 28. Behold, the name of the Lord comes from afar, burning with his anger and in thick rising smoke. His lips are full of fury and his tongue is like a devouring fire. His breath is like an overflowing stream that reaches up to the neck, to sift the nations with the sieve of destruction and to place on the jaws of the people a bridle that leads astray. As you have noticed, the passage speaks about the anger of the Lord. When God is silent, he can be disregarded. But when he rises to terrify the earth, then people will hide in caves and forget about their own idols. The anger of God is aroused by his concern for righteousness. He cannot tolerate injustice. But of course, we also know that God's anger lasts a moment, but at the end, his mercy will prevail. Isaiah is telling us that his love is so deep that despite people's sins, God still wants to begin again with the surviving remnant. And pay attention to this word remnant. Prophet Isaiah tells us about God's feeling. He is the father, but his own children deserted him. He is again tired of people. Remember, during the time of Noah, before the flood came, we hear God speaking, telling that he regretted that he created human beings. He hates their homage, their festivals, celebrations, because he cannot tolerate the corruption and injustice 
of his own children. Now, let us look at the beautiful song of the vineyard. It is in the book of Isaiah, chapter 5. Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choicest vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it. And he looked for it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, Judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I looked for it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. It shall not be pruned or hewed, and briars and thorns shall grow up. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. And here we have the last point. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are his pleasant planting. He looked for justice, but behold bloodshed, for righteousness, but behold an outcry. Now you realize that in this song of vineyard, we have two voices. The voice of the prophet at the beginning and at the end, and in the middle, God's voice. God is Isaiah's friend. He sings him a love song. His friend's efforts had been of no avail. What a disappointment. The vineyard was planted to yield righteousness and justice, but it yielded violence instead. And the main culprits are the leaders, the men of Judah. But Isaiah somehow also feels himself polluted by the whole situation. The prophet's anger and his tears. On the one hand, the prophet is angry with the whole situation because they do not listen to him. They laugh at his visions. And so he cries, do not forgive them. But at the same time, he weeps bitterly over the whole situation and then he beseeches God for mercy. What will be the response of God? Of course, he will listen. But before mercy, there will be affliction. I think we are all familiar with Isaiah chapter 6, the famous vision of God he had sitting upon the throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Then we have the seraphim with six wings, and the song that we sing during our Eucharist, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. But what is interesting in this passage, it is what God tells prophet to say to the people. Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. And here is the shocking statement. Make the heart of his people dull, and their ears heavy, and blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. Why such a strange mission? To harden the hearts of the people? The Bible has two kinds of punishment physical one and spiritual one. The spiritual punishment is foretold in that vision. The people are to be deprived of sensitivity to God and of the ability to repent. Hardening 
of one's heart can be either due to man himself or can come about as punishment from above. And the prophet, as you can see, he is asking here, how long, O oh Lord, I'm going to do it? The answer he gets, till the people experience full measure of punishment for their sin. And now we go back to the word remnant. Apparently the words of the prophet has no effects. Then God has to do something else in order to silence our arrogance. The purpose of the suffering is to create an age in which those who err in spirit come to understanding and those who murmur will accept instruction. The suffering should lead us to repentance and that repentance to transformation. If we look at Isaiah 10, 21, 22, we read, A remnant will return, the remnant of Jacob, to the mighty God. For though your people Israel will be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant of them will return. What kind of person will survive the ordeals of history? Again, we ask the prophet, Isaiah 33, 15. He who walks righteously and speaks uprightly, who despises the gain of oppressions, who shakes his hands lest they hold a bribe, who stops his ears from hearing of bloodshed and shuts his eyes from looking on evil that kind of person will survive. But beyond this hope, the hope that the remnant will return to the Lord, is the hope of the new heaven and new earth, the ultimate hope that the whole world will be transformed. Finally, we conclude with these comments. Isaiah never predicted the destruction of Jerusalem. However, and that's very important, God's protection of the city, its importance for the nations, and even its restoration depends on the combination of the two factors, reliance on God and holy living. To say God is in our midst, and yet walk in iniquity is to court a disaster or, as Isaiah told us, is trying to find a refuge in a lie.